Hello team and welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan M.S. Pierce. It's the Ukraine War News Update for the 10th of October 2023. Let's go to where we normally start, the Ukrainian general staff figures for the Russian losses for the day before. All the usual caveats apply, thanks to Davin. You can check out the caveats in the description below. Uh, slight uptick from yesterday that was very low and I suggested that was probably because it was a Monday, i.e. a Sunday figures being produced. So we're... we're trickling back up to figures we had seen previously, although still much lower in terms of equipment loss. 450 personnel uh, back up to around about sort of average figures for the last month, I guess. Uh, six, and remember, when you say average figures, these are humans we're talking about. Uh, six tanks and three armoured personnel vehicles, uh, it, it just hugely lower than, uh, than we'd seen maybe Saturday, Friday, and Thursday last week, uh, seven artillery systems is one of the lowest numbers I've seen for an awful long time. Uh, one anti-aircraft warfare system, 17 drones, uh, 12 vehicles and fuel tanks, and two pieces of special equipment. So uh, I don't know what to make of that, whether that is genuinely not a lot going on yesterday or just the way that they compiled their figures, there being uh, a bit of a lag, operational security lag. Uh, it could be that the figures are two days behind and, and yesterday and today represent Saturday and Sunday and it's quiet at the weekends or, or whatever. I'm not really sure. Uh, all I can say is Andrew Perpetua has quite a lot of uh, losses that he's totted up at as a mapper that looks at a lot of footage so it's i'm fairly sure he does a a good job of you know working out whether it's been logged before or not we have engineering vehicles and interestingly i've got something on that uh i think coming up which is you know the ukrainians going for some engineering vehicles that are digging the trenches something that i think it would have been uh really advantageous if they'd done uh, over the last six months but of course they weren't sort of close enough at the time or or committing to large frontal assault so they didn't have the drone operators and whatnot but you know, taking out excavators that are digging these trenches would be a case of prevention's better than cure. Uh, and uh, yeah, so we can see four, uh, four engineering vehicles there taken out, three by a drone. Um, the other one, I, I presume, is not an excavator, probably, I don't know, an IMR2, uh, but that's taken out by mine. It was, I was hearing, oh, I can't remember whether it was, they were talking about the ukrainians hitting russians or the russians hitting ukrainians but they go for the um the engineering vehicles the mine demining it's the russians hitting the ukrainians going for the demining vehicles rather than the tank or the bradley or whatever so you might think that something like a, a leopard 2 is a really high value uh, machine but if they have a chance, if there's two vehicles there and one's a, a Leopard 2 and the other's a D minor, they'll go for the D minor because without the D minor, the Leopard 2's in trouble. So the D minor is, is, is your highest value uh, vehicle there. Um, anyway, uh, it's just a bit of an aside. So quite a bit of artillery here from sort of D30 or old ones up to uh, the larger Pion and the Irrigan. Um, multiple launch rocket system and so on and so forth. So these are hit with a variety of things. Caesar and Gimler's guided multiple launch rocket systems like HIMARS and FPV drones. You've got some tanks in there and then a bunch of trucks uh, and a civilian loaf. For the Ukrainians, again, it's mainly civilian vehicles, a uh, couple of, uh, as, as in logistical vehicles, a couple of other bits and pieces, but nothing too uh too high value for the ukrainians so that i would say is in is to the advantage again of the ukrainians i think that there's this degradation of the russian forces that that is worse for the russians than it is for the ukrainians in terms of the ukrainians own losses uh and then here we have the ukrainian third brigade in a recent operation captured one of the battalion commanders of the russian 72nd mechanized brigade in the area of bakhmut so that's a high value pow there uh, I, I wonder if they'll be able to extricate information from him in the same way that they did when they captured the guy down in kherson in the Dnipro river that then gave them um all the all the information they needed fairly easily uh, epic footage here so this is footage i'm not going to show it to you in fact interesting looking at reporting from ukraine who does an analysis of this engagement this is near Novomikhailivka, south of marienka south of avdivka on that eastern front uh, but reporting from ukraine did a really good analysis of this whole um, operation 
and they blurred out every explosion even if it's a still so i think youtube are very tight on just explosions 79th uh, airborne assault brigade destroyed a whole column of of russians who tried to storm ukrainian positions in the marinka area south of there uh, this was very good for the ukrainians it, uh, an entire basically attack was thwarted when they were only sort of 200 meters from where they started rather than being 3,200 meters into the Ukrainian uh, heavily defended area. Uh, they were hit by sort of mines and uh, artillery precision guided munitions. So yeah, and then as soon as the vehicles were hit and the troops got out, they were hit with cluster munitions. So it was all quite a prepared defensive barrage really. So they're using the right kit for the right uh, job there so anyway a, a large number of pieces of kit taken out in that one exchange um, whether that features in this uh, in these figures or whether we'll see that reflected tomorrow i don't know uh, nonetheless yeah good good for the um, ukrainians there uh, Russians are preparing new defensive line trenches and fortifications. Ukrainian units are hunting down engineering equipment that provides uh, for the construction of it. So here you have an excavator that will almost certainly be one of the ones featuring in Andrew Perpetua's list there. And here we see it. I mean, you can check all these uh, uh, videos out by clicking on the links in the description below. I'm not going to show them because uh, YouTube don't like that. Uh, but an excavator here gets taken out. Uh, and uh, yeah, we can see that the Ukrainians are are trying to hit those, um, those tar targets as well. Now, I showed you some footage, just a tiny bit of footage. Here it is. Um, of... <laughs> An ammo dump getting hit. It's actually an ammo train. Forbes have done a. Uh, that's the stock footage. It's not. It's not a train with T sixty twos on. Uh, Forbes have written an article. Ukrainian artillery just blew up a Russian ammo train near Tokmak. Kiev's troops fought for months to make that possible. So they are basically emphasising the importance of this particular strike as being somewhere. So if I um, if I find my map. So here we have my map that JR has looked at. It has only the um, the Andrew Perpetua changes. I haven't done the other changes yet, but thanks to JR, legendary. Uh, anyway, I, I really wanted to show you firstly where Nova Mokalivka, where that destroyed column was. And that's in this area. So it's Nova Mokalivka. And I think they were coming up there in that direction. And they got hammered down here. Uh, so they didn't quite get far enough. And then it's Tokmak we're talking about. So Tokmak is surrounded here. This whole uh, salient is all about getting really to Tokmak. I, I suppose originally it would have been uh, maximally about getting to somewhere like Berdyansk or you know, certainly down to the sea, sea of Azov, but that is simply not uh, plausible now. The most realistic uh, uh, and uh, the, the greatest gains that they could the ukrainians could possibly make and again I, I would say that's going to be really difficult would be to get uh to tokmak but uh, you know forbes article here talks about how really they 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 have succeeded in achieving a really uh really decent goal in being able to take out um trains with ammo near the in the Tokmak area, so the Ukrainian strike on that Russian train near Tokmak only recently uh, was possible. Uh, while Ukrainian forces possess an array of deep strike weapons, Storm Shadow, Scalp, Land Attack missiles, Neptune and Harpoon anti ship missiles, S two hundred and Tocha. Tochka ballistic missiles and several types of drones. These weapons generally work best against static targets. Hitting a moving train is hard, which is why Russian efforts to strike Ukraine's own vital railway network have so far failed to impede Ukrainian logistics. To strike that ammo train, the Ukrainians needed good, fresh intelli intelligence, possibly from drones or local partisans, but they also needed to bring to bear their most responsive and accurate fires, that is, their GPS-guided Excalibur artillery shells and guided multiple launch rockets, so things like high mice etc the excalibur's fire from the american made m777 howitzers out of a range or out to a range of around 19 miles gimler's fire from high mars launchers or sort of similar m270 to about a distance of 44 miles that's 84 kilometers the ukrainians keep their m777s a few miles from the front line in order to complicate russian counter battery fire they keep their precious high miles even further back 
the line of contact probably needed to stabilize somewhere around Robotina, 12 miles north of Tokmak, before Ukraine's precision artillery effectively could target trains rolling through Tokmak. Um, so there you go, there, and, and there's much more detail in that, just the importance of hitting uh, that ammo train, obviously not only for the intrinsic value of taking out that ammunition uh, and for the effect that, that will then have, but also just in terms of showing that they can hit moving targets potentially on a railway network uh, that are that are really high value uh, targets. And, and it's that... that uh, idea of getting fire control over logistics which is kind of you know the point of this um counter offensive you know they want to uh, be able to take out logistics along this road the m14 but also other logistics around and they're getting closer and closer to top the top mac is now fully in like artillery range is, is kind of the point there okay uh fpv drone strikes on russian two s5 jet since s a 152 mil self-propelled gun Okay, why I've included this, I'm not showing it to you, it's just an, another FPV drone hitting another piece of kit, but the strike was allegedly carried out a distance of 17.4 kilometers. This is a huge distance for an FPV drone, so we've heard hints that the 10 kilometer range that we normally see is going to be uh, going to be changed. Uh, the range is going to be increased going forward. There are some new drones coming online, and it appears that this this is happening for the Ukrainians. So most FPV drone strikes do not exceed the distance of 10 kilometers. Any strikes greater than 10 kilometers are considered long range. As stated by the source, there are already ideas on how to make FPV drones fly even further. Right. This is massively bloody significant. If it is true, you are going to have drones that can hit, again, you're talking about moving targets and targets that are within your longer range or your medium range artillery uh, range. Now, that means you don't have to rely so much on artillery. Artillery can then be moved further back. You can have drones operating in a way that that artillery were uh, and with arguably greater precision. This is really, really significant. Like if you, if you if, so say you have drone operators in this salient and you're talking about 17 uh 17.4 kilometers there well tokmak is 24 kilometers so although you're not you can't get into tokmak from there actually if you've got drone operators a little bit closer you are starting to be able to hit the outskirts of tokmak with fpv drones and that is absolutely uh phenomenal you, 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 the capability is now changed you know you can you can hit the second line of defense or or third line, depending on what you call it, third line in trenches, depending on whether that is your second. So you've got your first lines here, second one there, maybe third lines around Ochiro Tuvati. Suddenly, that is all in first-person view drone range. I mean, this is really significant. That single bit of video, uh, if it's true, is it has all sorts of implications for the whole front line. And if Ukraine have that... Uh, advantage over the Russians at least for some time if there's a lead time on that then then they need to take massive advantage over that so we have seen first person view drones the Ukraine is having like a six month six month lead time or, on being able to use these in a way that Russians weren't now the Russians are kind of caught up and we're seeing quite a lot of Russian first person view drone footage or or hits so as you can see down here first person view drones are being used by the Russians and they are taking out bits of kit and that wasn't the case like six months ago where it was for, for the Ukrainians now now the Ukrainians potentially had this big range advantage they need to take huge advantage of that uh, capitalize on it uh, until the Russians can catch up. Right. Assuming that the Russians are, aren't already operating first person view drones with that kind of range. Okay. So moving on to distance strikes here. Last night, I mean, goodness me, it's it's all on a spectrum, isn't it? Where where do I call distance strike? You know, drones are getting longer and longer range for these first person view drones. I talk, I talk about Shahid drones being distance drones, but you've got now got this just spectrum uh, where it's really hard to demarcate anything because you just got the capabilities all along that spectrum. Um, last night, Russia attacked Ukraine with a total of 36 Shahid drones, of which 27 were shot down. Uh, so what is that? That's uh, just over two thirds, so 70% maybe um, of, of 
drone shot down interception rate 70 percent so that's okay i guess i mean as we move further and further into this war you have higher and higher expectations for interception rates it just depends where the russians decide to send these drones uh they there have been both sides have been probing with their drone use and missile use i'll send out one here one there to see if they are almost a sacrificial drones to see where the air defense systems are and then they send waves in to capitalize on where the air defense systems aren't uh, the attacks were primarily though aimed at odessa mikhailiv and kherson regions so again the grain uh export infrastructure being targeted which is you know as you see here russia bombing danube port southwest uh, in southwestern ukraine again this is uh, a real problem for the Ukrainians. We know that Germans have got some Gepards and an RST on the way to this general region, but the Ukrainians are desperate for air defense here. And we'll come on to air defense in the military aid segment later. There's an absolutely fascinating article in the New Yorker, typical New Yorker article, which is about 20 million words long, um, about Jake Sullivan and about weapons uh, from the US to ukraine about joe biden really interesting article and i'm going to dip into that in in the military aid se section anyway uh finally for for this um the number of people killed by russian missile attack on rosa so that was where the cafe stroke um grocery store that was being used for a wake uh was hit by the russians the russians saying it's a it's a bona fide target because the person who whose funeral it was was a military individual yeah but everyone who was there were were civilians and you've killed now it looks like they killed 53 with five people still missing so quite possibly 58 um uh, people there that were killed there just to remind you of that horror um and that they're still working on finding people there okay uh, zelensky so we're on to other bits and pieces here zelensky replaces command of the territorial for defense forces so president zelensky has dismissed ihor tansura from the position of ukraine's territorial defense forces commander replacing him with anatoly uh bahilevich um uh, a new the new commander was the deputy chief of staff of the Grand Forces Command. So a bit of shuffling there. Don't know what the reason is, uh, but that has happened. I just thought I'd say, well, what are the Territorial Defence Forces? You might not know what the difference between them and, you know, any other groupings. So Territorial Defence Forces uh, are the military reserve component of the armed forces of Ukraine. So they were formed after the reorganisation of Territorial Defence Battalions, volunteer militias created during the war in Donbass under the command of the Ministry of Defence. Territorial Defence units existed from 2015 to 21 in semi-organised forms until 2022 when they were officially organised into a unified corps that formed a separate branch of the Armed Forces of Ukraine. It is formed by a corps of part-time reservists, usually former combat veterans, and in cases of war can be expanded to include local civilian volunteers for local defence. In a case of mass mobilization when the corps expected to lead the mobilized volunteer is expected to lead the mobilized volunteers. The TDF was officially activated within with the start of the 2022 invasion and more than 100,000 civilians had volunteered by March. The International Legion of Territorial Defense of Ukraine formed by foreign volunteers is part of the Territorial Defense Forces. So these are not your crack frontline troops. Uh, although they have been used in, in different ways. The tasks as set out on this wiki page, uh, in concordance with the Constitution, the legislation passed by the Supreme Council, the TDF fulfills the following missions. Protection of public authorities, local governments, critical facilities, important public enterprises and communications, deployment at checkpoints, combating sabotage and intelligence forces of the enemy, at, and any illegal armed formations and looters maintaining safety and security in any of the administrative divisions of ukraine region city districts and townships organization of resistance and or guerrilla groups in case of territory being captured by the enemy providing search and rescue and disaster operations and mitigation during cases of peacetime natural and man-made disasters so in other words they aren't going to be the people that are thrown into the front lines in the robotina uh, sector to take trenches right so the, the territorial defense forces are super important they have their own role uh but they they aren't you know 
they aren't your your frontline troops. Uh, but anyway, the change of the leadership of them, I just thought I'd do a bit of a sidebar there. Um, correct me if I'm wrong with any of my claims. Uh, this is just a, a, a picture here. Instead of a thousand words, says Anton Gerashchenko, a British volunteer, Harley Whitehead, and and part of the mines that he helped clear off Ukrainian lands. Thank you, sir. I mean, just thousands of mines uh, that these guys clear uh painstakingly there was someone on one of my threads uh on my thread last night for the live stream so please go and check the live stream out i interviewed two volunteers working uh working under incredibly demanding conditions in kramatorsk and uh, surrounding areas uh helping with evacuations and all sorts of different things go and check that live stream out it was really enlightening uh but one person on the thread was like i want to help with demining how do i how do i go about doing that so there are several organizations tip of the spear and halo trust are two ones that, that i'm aware of uh, but i'm sure there are others um SBU detains a factory director for allegedly transferring $400,000 to Russian proxy forces. The security services of Ukraine and the State Bureau of Investigation detained uh, this chap in Kiev Oblast. Um, it, the suspect is a director of a foundry in the occupied city of Makivka in Donetsk Oblast. Uh, this is the issue with the whole Ukraine war is there are so many people, there are people in occupied territories who are pro-Ukrainian and doing things to help the Ukrainians and there are people in Ukrainian territories who are pro-Russian helping the Russians and it's just a big hot mess. And anyway, the Ukrainians are consistently working to, uh, you know, um, wheedle out those who are pro-Russian within Ukrainian areas there now. The, uh, oh no, that's me done actually. I'm not going to get onto that. That's, wait for it. Goodness me, that's the next video. Anyway, thank you for watching uh, this one. I'll upload this and in the meantime, uh, get on with sorting out my next video. Uh, take care, speak to you soon.